So today I'm here speaking to you about stress management and the ways that stress management can also help you manage your health. Um, let me see if we can get our slideshow. Here we go. So first, I just kind of want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm here speaking to you about stress management, in particular um, stress management in relation to managing chronic illness. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and life coach. I have a background in, in clinical interpersonal practice, psychology, and sociology. And interpersonal practice, essentially, uh, we aim to restore, maintain, and promote social functioning relating to people and how they interact with their environment. And of course, psychology is the study of the human mind and how it affects our emotions and our behavior. And sociology is the study of social problems. And in social work, we aim at alleviating the conditions of any person who needs help or support. And so I think it's kind of ironic sometimes how I had all of this training and then I got sick and it kind of has helped prepare me for being sick really well. And so I was diagnosed with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, endometriosis, and a host of other things while I was in grad school with um, getting my master's in social work. And I had no frame of reference for any of this. I did not know what to do with any of the information that I got. Um, and. I kind of experienced crisis. I tried to seek out the support of therapists only to find out that nobody really understood what I was going through and they did not know how to help me. Uh, so of course, through this realization, I decided maybe this is something that I could do to help other people when I get to a place where I can help other people. And so that is why I'm doing what I'm doing now. So everything that I talk about in my presentations, um, I, I've been through it and a lot of these stress management techniques are what has helped me. And I have two businesses and it's the only reason I'm able to be up here today speaking to you because it's helped me so much. So of course, this is kind of like my street cred in the chronic illness world, right? My, my worst moments. Um, in 2017, I decided I was gonna do the Women's March. And of course, the first part of the Women's March is standing in the sun waiting to march. <laughs> and at this point, I was still kind of trying to live the same life that I used to live before I got sick, even though with lupus, you're not supposed to be in the sun. And of course, um, Five days later, I was in bed, unable to move, and another five days later, I decided, okay, I need to go in, and had to go to the emergency room and get prednisone intravenously, which was a really kind of humbling wake-up experience that I needed to make some changes and readjust my life, and I think a lot of us go through that at some point, and um, that's when I think the major shift happened for me. So a lot of these these things, um, if they sound like you, they could be signs that you might be under a significant amount of stress. Um, if you feel nervous, anxious, or stressed all the time, if you would describe that that's how you feel. If you feel like things never go your way or you just can't handle all the things that you should be able to handle. If you feel like you're not confident in your ability to man manage st stressful situations or events. And if something happens to you, do you tend to get emotionally wrapped up in the negative aspects of it, whether that's just any kind of negative outcome that could come up, the dangers involved, or any harm that might come to you? If you feel overwhelmed at the thought of planning your day, your tasks, or your to-do lists, um, let alone planning for your future and bigger goals for yourself. If you have a hard time regulating your emotions, and, and I hear a lot, that maybe people are familiar with relaxation strategies, but they don't know if they're really working for them or if they're doing them the right way, or maybe they only use them when they're really stressed out. Um, when someone asks you what your strengths are, maybe you're not sure if you have any worth mentioning. 
if you have a hard time letting go of things that bother you and maybe even get angry or frustrated easily or even have a hard time enjoying your favorite activities. These are all telltale signs that you might be under a lot of stress. So before I get into the 10 ways, I kind of want to talk a little bit about some definitions of what we mean by stress and what exactly it is. So when we are talking about stress, stress is uh, how our brain and our body work to respond to any type of demand that is placed on it. So we call these demands stressors. And it's anything that disrupts our internal balance where we have our balance in our body is called homeostasis. And our body is constantly seeking to regain that balance. So anything that requires change or adaptation on a physical level, emotional, psychological, or social, these things are what we would consider stress. And these can be good or bad events. So sometimes things that can cause us stress are not things we typically think of as stressful, like exercise or getting a new job or getting married or having kids. Um, so they include all of those experiences. And they also can include the negative stuff, traumatic events or experiences, um, loss, things like that. So there's two parts to any stressor. There's our psychological interpretation of that demand that it's placing on us, and then there's our body's response to it. So stress also is necessary. So there's a double-edged sword here. We actually need stress in order to survive, in order to get through some of the things that we need to get through. It pushes us, it motivates us. So stress is necessary, but it also can have a negative effect on our overall well-being. So normal everyday stress in healthy individuals is typically adaptive and it doesn't pose any health risks, but if stress becomes chronic and persistent and unchanging, especially if you're not already in good health, it can really have serious long-term effects for us. Um, and the amount of damage that it has is directly related to three factors. One is the types of stress that we experience. Two is how persistent it is in our lives. And three is our available resources and coping patterns and how we respond to those stressors. So we're really talking about stress versus distress. So it was really interesting because as I've been researching this, um, I'm also creating an online course for stress management because it's been so impactful for me and so impactful for many of my clients. Um, I'm like asking myself, you know, what exactly does stress do to our body? And as I'm researching this and I'm listing all these things on the slide, I'm like, holy moly, I don't have room for them all. <laughs> they, it literally affects every organ system in our body. And I don't think that we really realize how detrimental it is to us. So just some statistics. Um, in the US, the amount of people that regularly experience psychological symptoms caused by stress is 73%. 48% uh, of us feel like our stress has increased over the past five years, right? So it's not getting any better. Um, money and work are the leading cause of stress for 76% of us. And about half of Americans lie awake at night due to stress. We have 48% uh, of us say that stress has a negative impact on their personal and professional life. 54% of us say that stress has caused them to fight with the people close to them. And 30% of us say they're always under stress at work. And then when it comes to the physical symptoms, which of course we have many here, but the top three that people experience are fatigue, headache, and upset stomach. And I think when we think about the physical manifestations of stress, those tend to be the things we think of first. And psychological symptoms, the most common top three for psychological symptoms of stress are irritability or anger, feeling nervous, and lack of energy or fatigue. 
So I think you might already be able to see how this can negatively impact those of us who have chronic illnesses because we're already sensitive and susceptible to stress. And of course there's more. Um, but the most important thing I think is this list over here that if you already have these things, it can make them worse. And of course, autoimmune diseases is on that list, but a whole host of other things like depression and anxiety and pain and sleep problems that already come with our chronic illnesses because we're so lucky. <laughs> so now we'll get into the 10 ways. So first, the just to be clear of what the goal of stress management is, is it's to improve our quality of life through increasing our healthy coping strategies. And this will reduce the negative consequences that stress has on us. And it also incorporates mind, body, and spirit, and it encourages an intuitive relationship between all three. And overall, the goal, of course, the biggest goal is to improve our health outcomes. So the first way that stress management can help us manage our um, health better is that it forces us to examine our choices. So the biggest determinant in whether or not we're going to experience distress, which is the negative aspects of stress, is how we perceive and choose to respond to the stressful event. So our choices are what matters and how we respond to it. And our choices are affected by so many things, our language, our beliefs, our culture, and of course our available resources. So we examine choices in stress management. We look at our decision-making habits, our coping methods, and we want to look at trends and patterns in our behavior so we can look for opportunities to change anything that might not be uh, helping us. The second uh, reason is it encourages goal setting and problem solving. So when we look at coping, we typically have two categories, emotion-focused coping and problem-focused coping. And we know that any kind of coping response that is more action-oriented and engaged is much better outcome-wise for our health. So goal setting and problem solving helps build confidence and experience, and both of these things increase a thing called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is essentially the confidence that we have in completing any task and doing it well. And research tells us that if we have a high sense of self-efficacy, we have lower levels of stress. So essentially, if we increase our confidence through goal setting and problem solving and practicing situations to get better at them, it's going to reduce our stress. So this includes learning how to make planned choices, self-monitoring so you can notice how you're making those choices, and habituating, which is essentially unlearning of unhelpful responses. And we do this as situations come up, all which reduce stress. It encourages action and a focus on solutions rather than what sometimes we do, which is ruminate on the problem. And when we ruminate, which is essentially overanalyzing the problem, that can lead us down a spiral towards depression. And we definitely don't want that. So the next is it places our basic needs as top priority. And as I was looking at this last night, I thought, man, I should have flipped the triangle upside down so or physiological needs is at the top because my therapy clients will probably, um, they, they tend to not like this, but I, they come in and the first thing I ask them is, how are you meeting your basic needs? You know, are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? And they kind of roll their eyes. But, but this is the most important thing because these are the things that tend to go first when we're under a lot of stress. So if someone says they're not eating well, they're not sleeping well, that's a, a red flag to me that they're under stress that week. So when we're in distress, our basic needs go first. And we also tend to replace these with unhealthy behaviors, things like overeating food, maybe that isn't so healthy for us, smoking, drinking alcohol, things like that. Even not being as active, you know, sitting around and watching TV more than we should. 
Um, but when we prioritize our basic needs, this is our foundation that we have for managing stress. It makes us more resilient because our body is in a better position to regain balance if we are meeting our basic needs. So these are always things that I check on first. And I do it for myself too. Number four, it forces you to examine your social support system. This can be a sensitive topic for some people, uh, but I am kind of one of those uh, therapists who encourages my clients to be very unapologetic about their needs and what they are. And examining our social support system and our relationships is necessary in managing stress. If we're socially isolated, we're more likely to experience negative stress. And if we have people in our immediate circle who perpetuate or encourage negative or unhealthy behaviors or beliefs, or they just aren't supportive, that can lead to more stress as well. So it, stress management really encourages us to surround ourselves with people who are gonna lift us up and not sink us. And also it encourages us to have a, a greater connectedness to our community and people around us. I think there was a statistic recently that said that people who have a good social support system live up to 10 to 20 years longer in life. And that was very shocking to me because I think it really demonstrates how important it is to be connected to other people. So number five, Stress management, of course, as another foundational aspect, requires emotional and psychological well-being. Um, so our thoughts and our feelings play a major role in whether or not we experience the negative effects of stress because research shows us that if we focus on negative or irrational or unhelpful thoughts, it can actually weaken our immune system because it's leading our nervous system to be constantly aroused. And it's it's basically creating a wear and tear on us, like a wear and tear on a car, but at a much faster rate. And it leads us to, again, engaging in unhealthy behaviors or coping responses. And so if we perceive a situation to be negative or harmful in some way, our body is going to follow suit. I tell my clients, your brain is an amazing organ. It literally has this undying uh, function to protect us and preserve our humanity in every way possible. So if you perceive a situation to be negative or harmful or scary, your body is gonna follow suit because it's basically saying there's danger out there, this is stressful, and so your fight or flight response is gonna kick on. But the problem is, is if it never kicks off and you can't go into that restorative phase, then you, your body is just wearing and wearing and wearing. So if we can adjust our perception of situations, then we can have more rational responses, we can have, uh, feel more confident in handling situations, and our body is gonna be less stressed overall. So number six, of course, um, and this I think affects all of these, is stress management requires what I call radical self-awareness. And self-awareness, if you can't see in this little box, I think this is a great definition for it. It's the ability to take an honest look at our lives without attachment to it being right or wrong. So I tell people nothing we do is inherently right or wrong, it's how we judge it that makes it so. And if we can develop a self-awareness where we can objectively look at our behavior, our thoughts, our feelings, then we can really make changes necessary to benefit our health. And self-awareness helps people recognize stress, how they're responding to it. It helps them see where they might be perpetuating any kind of unhelpful coping responses so that it gives us that opportunity to take control and change it. And we also become more aware of our thoughts and feelings and this, again, allowing us the opportunity to change it increases our sense of self-efficacy so we feel more confident in how we handle things. And again, this reduces stress. Number seven, it makes us prioritize. This is a tough one. 
I think, as well, because, um, and I've already had a couple conversations today about the impacts of work. I think that, um, and I remember growing up, I started working at the age of 14, and at every job, I heard the same thing. This job comes first. And I think that one of the shifts I had to make was that, no, work does not come first. My body comes first, my health comes first. And that's a huge shift for some people to make. But what I tell people is to think of stress management like an act of balancing scales. And um, I have on my printout, but it's not on this one, I must have added this later, I have a picture of scales here, but if you can imagine the scales, right, if you've got stress on one side and it's weighing it down, we only have two options. We can either add something restorative to this side to balance it out, or we can remove things from the stress plate to balance it out. Those are the only two options that we have. So. We prioritize self-care. The things that I encourage my clients to add on the other side are self-care behaviors. So things like uh, doing things that you enjoy, relaxation strategies, taking walks in nature because nature's proven to reduce stress. Anything that helps fill your cup uh, is considered self-care. But we want to also get rid of anything that is unnecessary, unhelpful, unhealthy, anything that we can get rid of that isn't absolutely necessary to our survival. We want to kind of weed out and prioritize the good stuff. So number eight, stress management teaches you to be selfish. I encourage my clients to be selfish. I tell them, again, to have a kind of sorry, not sorry attitude about their needs. And it, just like the picture says, we can't pour from an empty cup. And of course, I'm sure you've heard the, you can't put, you have to put your oxygen mask on first before you help other people on the plane, right? You have to help yourself first before you can add anything to the world. And I think that stress management definitely prioritizes this. And so if you think about it, a lot of the things I've already talked about today are focusing on ourself, our internal states, how we respond to things, what's going on in our mind and body. And so it really encourages putting us in the driver's seat, which makes us more confident in how we're able to handle anything that comes up. It places a huge emphasis on healthy coping behaviors, of course, like self-care, exercise, healthy eating, um, and all of these activities can have a positive effect on disease management. So I, I tell people, think of stress management as disease management because it's going to positively affect your health. And it's going to teach you to be more intuitive in terms of symptoms that come up or anything that comes up um, in relation to your illness. Number nine, it encourages productive communication. So a huge aspect of stress management is learning communication skills. Um, and this has positive effects on our relationships and our social interactions. This can come in handy when we're communicating with doctors, when we're communicating with our care team, and all of these things can reduce stress. So a person uh, in communication skills training uh, for stress management might learn to more efficiently navigate social stressors, set healthy boundaries, um, and it also can help adjust our expectations of how a situation might go and our perceptions of social environments. Sometimes things come up uh, in therapy and I'll encourage my clients you know, to tell me about the situation. And we'll kind of talk about what their perception is and I might give my perception of it. And we realize that two people have completely different perceptions of the same situation. So it really encourages us opening up and trying to think outside the box in terms of how we communicate and also how we interpret situations. And number 10, what I think sometimes can be the most important and, and also a good place to start with stress management is setting better boundaries. Now, I think we tend to think of boundaries as, you know, the physical boundaries when we're little kids. We learn about our personal space bubble. 
Um, but there are so many different types of boundaries we can set, and boundaries are a spectrum as well. So if you've ever seen the movie Yes Man, uh, you might know that we can end up living our lives saying yes to everything and everyone, and before we know it, we are on the path to trying to make everyone happy, and we've lost ourselves along the way. So finding our way back can be really hard, uh, but healthy boundaries essentially helps us get our needs met in relationships. It increases our capacity for compassion, and we actually experience less anger and resentment toward others. It creates a space that we need to prioritize and nourish our mind, body, and spirit. And of course, that's what stress management is all about. So when we don't set boundaries, what ends up happening is not only do people not respect our boundaries, but we end up feeling taken advantage of, burned out, stressed out, and we end up as people pleasers or workaholics. We tend to be isolated or feel even more misunderstood. So I often tell people that setting boundaries is one of the best things you can do for your health. Um, so we have boundaries around our emotions, our ideas, our time, our material possessions, our personal and intimate spaces, and all of these areas are things to explore in stress management.